Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My name is Dawood Yaseen. I'm the Director of Student Life and the Director of the Zaytuna College Center for Ethical Living and Learning. I am here on Zaytuna's beautiful campus in the heart of Berkeley, in the area known as the Holy Hill. Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed us to see another Ramadan. May it be full of love and light and openings from Allah Ta'ala. I've been asked, alhamdulillah, to speak about a topic of healthy habits as, result, as relates to our physical body. Inshallah Ta'ala will all acknowledge and pursue healthy habits spiritually, um, intellectually, inshallah Ta'ala, and then also physically. So this is something that has been a topic I've been thinking about for quite some time. There's literature from both the Qur'an, from the Sunnah, um, and also from our scholars, Imam Ghazali in particular, who I'd like to read from today, that really point us to this uh, importance of ensuring uh, that our food um, doesn't become something that inhibits us in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both inside of Ramadan and out. But Ramadan is a great opportunity for us to begin to think about that. I mean, the first thing we want to think about in terms of food, perhaps, is obviously only consuming that from the lawful. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about eating that which is halal and tayyib, um, this is a concept, if we want to talk about halal, that which is legally uh, permissible, we would say, and then tayyib, uh, looking at, perhaps I say anyway, looking at the ethics, um, uh, where our food is coming from, uh, how are people treated who are who are uh, um, harvesting this food, and then obviously animals. How are animals treated um, uh, before uh, when they are living and also after uh, the time or during the time um, of, of ritual slaughter as well. So these are all areas that we've talked about in the past, but there's something in particular that I want to talk about as relates to, uh, to Ramadan because many people will be fasting in different areas, uh, not only in the U.S., but also globally. And it's important that we look at not only how our body will respond physically, but then what is the relationship to our physical abilities and our worship. Obviously, this is a month of ibadah, it's a month of Qur'an, it's a month of patience. And inshallah ta'ala, we want to ensure that all of those are working at their optimal, or we are benefiting from them um, with the most op in the most optimal, optimal way that we can. So, thinking about that, one, obviously, as we said, ensuring that our food is uh, from a halal uh, source, first and foremost. And as a reminder, I think it's important for us, uh, Allah says in the Quran, فَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ ذِكْرَ تَنْفَعَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Remind one another because in that reminder is a mutual benefit. So first and foremost, let's look at the relationship between our food and supplication, for example. The Prophet is uh, with his companions, peace and blessings be upon him, and may Allah be pleased with all of them. He's sitting with them and a, he tells them about a man. A man who is tawil uh, safar he's on a long journey. He's covered in dust, his hair is disheveled. So he's giving them a real description of, uh, of, the, of the trials perhaps that the man has taken during this travel. And then he says that, uh, He raises his hands to the sky and he calls out, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, my Lord, my Lord. Now this is important, why? Because we understand and we believe and we affirm in metaphysical causalities that there are certain places, certain times when our supplication is readily accepted from Allah Ta'ala, Almighty God. And this is one of the examples when a person is traveling. So now he reaches his hands up to the sky. He's in a state where his supplication should be readily accepted from God, but yet uh, the Prophet ﷺ then continues to say that his food is haram, his drink is haram, and his clothing is haram, and he is nourished by the haram. So God says, how can I accept his supplication? So this should give us pause, because right there, it's affirming that there's a relationship between what we eat and our ibadah, our worship, with Allah. So this month, obviously we don't want the month to be focused on food only, and that has its own problem, so to speak, right? Because it's interesting, uh, Imam Ghazali talks about that in another area where he says that um, 
constant thought and anxiety about where my meal will come from or what is going to be for dinner or thinking about food in that way um, where one has uh, distractions from uh, what they're doing in the day is, is, is an indication that we've lost our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to provide for us. And as we know, those provisions are given for us and, and um, affirmed for us before we're even sent into this world. So again, it gives us a lot to reflect on, a lot to think about. Now, back to this point about the food and the drink. It's not that they're from in and of themselves, that he's eating something which is prohibited by law, or he's drinking something which is prohibited by law. Most of the scholars in this commentary talk about the fact that the sources of income that is purchasing the food is unlawful in the sight of God. So now that which he purchases and eats, then that thing prohibits him in his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his supplication. So now we've established that. But I want to talk about something a little bit different here. One is our physical well-being during the month of Ramadan. Now I'm not talking about exercise regimens and other things such as that. That's a different discussion for a different time. What I want to talk about is our physical well-being. So inshallah ta'ala we're optimizing our worship during this month. Because as we know, the paradox of the month is as soon as we see the moon, it also indicates that it's vanishing as well, right? It's growing each day, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing. It reaches a full moon, which lets us know that half of the month is over, and then it begins to wane, okay? So one of the things uh, that we've done this semester, um, I've been reading a book with uh, our students here, Breaking the Two Desires by Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, and he gives 10 uh, benefits of hunger. And in reading the first one, it, was, it struck me because it connects to something uh, medically that I had read uh, by another author, contemporary author, and inshallah ta'ala, I'll share both of them with you right now. Imam Abu, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, he says that hunger has 10 benefits. He says the first of these is the purification of the heart, the illumination of the natural disposition, as he calls al, al qariha and the sharpening of one's insight, basira. For satiety engenders being full, having our stomachs full, engenders lack of intellect, blindness of the heart, and increases the vapors of the vein, uh, sorry, the vapors of the brain to produce a form of inebriation. So the sources of thought are repressed, and the heart finds it burdensome to perceive things in a rapid manner. Now that's interesting because he uses the term inebriation. Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali is writing this book over 900 years ago. Now, let's fast forward to this text written by an author, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, University of Cambridge. She's a neuro, uh, neurologist and she's also a nutritionist. She writes, yeast requires glucose and other sugars of, as food. Sugars come from the digestive carbohydrates. In healthy people, dietary glucose gets converted into lactic acid, water, and energy through a biochemical process called glycosis. In people with yeast overgrowth, candida, these things hijack the glucose and digest it in a different way called alcoholic fermentation. This is happening inside of our stomachs. In this biochemical process, candida and other yeast convert dietary glucose into alcohol, ethanol, and its byproduct, acetaldehyde. This phenomenon was first described in adults who appeared to be drunk without consuming any alcohol. Remember, Imam Ghazali used the term inebriation, and she says through her studies and the research that she was engaging in that adults had the characteristics of being drunk without consuming any alcohol. Later on, it was found out that these adults had an overgrowth of yeast in their gut and with particularly uh, produced alcohol and made them permanently quote unquote drunk, she writes. These people were particularly drunk after a carbohydrate meal because carbohydrates are consumed by candida with the production of alcohol. So this is something that I wanna talk about. If we want to maximize our worship in this month, perhaps there are areas that we're not even looking at as to why I'm fatigued. Maybe it's not just the long nights, or maybe it is because we're not getting sufficient sleep, but 
imagine that it's compounded now with certain foods that we are eating that are slowing us down in our worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we think about a healthy Ramadan, yes, we have to think about ourselves healthy spiritually, yes, healthy intellectually, yes, but also healthy physically beyond just we're not getting enough sleep or maybe I'm not getting enough carbohydrates or I'm not getting enough um, you know, other forms of energy to, to, to give me the strength that I need. Perhaps we need to look at a deeper level. And so I just think it's interesting that we have from our past, from modern uh, science here, both telling us the same thing. And inshallah ta'ala, I think because this is a month of self-examination, it's a month of recommitment, that we can use this opportunity, we can use these 30 days to really look inside of us and look at what goes inside of us and how those things can uh, be an impediment to the real openings that we're hopeful of and desirous of in this month. So alhamdulillah, may Allah bless us to have a fruitful month a month that is filled with love, a month that is filled with light, Allah is nur, a month that is filled with companionship, a month that is uh, feeding people, uh, engaging in, 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 in building community for those who don't have community, people that are new converts, people that maybe don't have access to transportation, but just really looking to give in this month and serve in a way that is pleasing to Almighty God and entering happiness into the hearts of the believers. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a blessed uh, Ramadan and bless us in the remaining days and nights of the month of Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this opportunity to be here with all of you. And we ask you, alhamdulillah, to continue to, to, to bless us, Alhamdulillah, with your support. Shukran, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.